Hi folks, I'm Dennis. We've got to replace a radiator in a 2004 Jeep Liberty automatic with air four-wheel drive. So let's get started. I've gotten my new radiator. I've got to get it out of the box and get it prepped to go in the car. You want to be careful with them because again the fins can, it's all made out of uh, aluminum and it's soft so the fins can uh, get bent pretty easily. <clears throat> Alright, you got to do a couple of things before you can start installing this radiator. The new one comes with a bag of four nuts. They've got to go into the plastic ears that are used to hold the radiator in with the bolts that we took out earlier. On the, uh, on the old radiator, these wings on the side have these rubber mounting grommets. Uh, there the plastic wing fits in, fits in that slot. It's got a thicker side and a thinner side. The thicker side goes on the same side as the hose outlets. So we've got they're the same side to side, but the necks are on this side. So the thicker side of that goes on the same side as the neck. So that's the thicker side, thinner side. Net goes on like so, just slides in. One of the things that you'll notice possibly about your replacement is, for example, this one, it's got a uh, transmission oil cooler built into the radiator. Now, this particular Jeep doesn't use it because, as you saw when we took the radiator out, there's a separate transmission oil cooler. And the original radiator over here, you see it doesn't have those caps um, or those fittings like the new ones got uh, it's no problem it just means we're not going to use those on this one because the external transmission oil cooler will do a better job and we don't want to have to reroute all the lines so we'll just leave these capped it's no problem all right the other thing that you got to do you got to put these nuts in to the the molded in keepers that hold these things, holds a um, radiator in. You'll notice, I'm not sure you can see it on the video or not, but there's a, there's a mark in these nuts and there's a little ear on one of them. The, that ear will, it'll, there's a slot that inside of those little brackets that this nut fits into. You want that ear to go away from where the bolt comes through because that'll hold it in there, keep it from falling out when you're putting the uh, radiator in. So you can see right here how that nut's in there flush and with that little ear sticking in there, there's a, a bit of plastic that'll hold that nut in there so you don't have to worry about it coming out. So we've got these two are in there where they're supposed to be. Since we're not going to use the transmission oil coolers or cooler, we're going to just leave those caps in there. We won't have to worry about those. I'm going to take that, slide that in there just like that. Same with this one. Again, that ear sticking to the away from the where the bolt's going to come in. The ear on the nut. Slip that in there like that. You can you can tell if you got them in the right spot um, just by looking through here like this and um, making sure you can see the bolt hole. And if it's not quite lined up, just push it down in there a little further. It'll line it right back up. Now, if your Jeep is different than mine and you do have to use these uh, these transmission. Uh, cooler lines here then what you'll do is you, you will have had to have disconnected the lines from these two before you took your radiator out you'll take these red plastic caps out 
and after you get your radiator in, you'll you'll put those lines back in and be careful to not cross thread them because they're they're brass fittings. As you get ready to put it in, okay, looking down into the uh, engine compartment here, right here, and right right there is the mounting hole or the the hole where those two ears fit down in there on the bottom of that radiator. They fit down in that hole. That's what keeps the bottom of it in place. So again, being as gentle as you can, because you don't want to beat these fins up anymore than you have to. Get the radiator in place. Remember, we're going to have to lift up on the condenser to get it down under there like that hose out of the way. Make sure the condenser stays out of the way. Make sure those two top wings that we put the rubber mounts in are in front of these steel parts right behind the headlights because the bolts go through them. And you're just going to have to make room with all of this to make those pins snap down in, in those holes. Okay, You can kind of reach down in there and push those pins in to drop down in the hole. Once you get them to drop down in the hole, well, then you're okay. I just realized something different with mine that I didn't know. You've got this this bracket here that we that the ear on the AC condenser came out of. It's just a little slip-in holder. Well, on the old radiator, there was a bolt hole right over here on the side of it that the Transmission oil cooler bolted too. Well, that's missing on this one probably because this is a radiator That's got a transmission oil cooler built into it. So I'm gonna have to get creative and figure out how to mount this Over here. I'm hoping I can slip them both in that bracket uh, If I can't I'll just have to figure out something else that I can put uh, here to bolt it to or to wire tie it to or something so but to continue on with this I got to take this uh, lower ear on both sides of the AC condenser and slip it into these brackets on each side of the uh, each side of the radiator. There's one on each side. I've got to get this uh, rubber baffle in between the radiator and the AC condenser over the, over this boss like we pulled it off of. Get that done on both sides and then I'll drop the condenser in and then try to figure out and put those bolts in and then try to figure out how to mount up that transmission oil cooler. Probably will have to lift up on your radiator just a little bit to get the holes to line up. And I'll put the baffle back in. It goes over the bosses on the radiator and in between the radiator and the, the AC condenser. Same thing down there on the bottom. You gotta, you gotta get it over the bracket that uh, holds the AC condenser in. I get all of this on film, and I apologize. I thought I was recording, but to get this baffle over here in place takes a lot of work. You gotta hold this condenser unit out, get it from the bottom, tuck back behind the condenser, between the condenser and the radiator. Once you get the bottom of it tucked in there, then you can just pull it down and get it lined up over the top or at the top part. <clears throat> and then the, uh, the hole in that baffle that clips onto that ear that we looked at earlier, you can get down in there with a screwdriver and just pop it up on that ear and then you're fine. With the bracket sticking through the baffles, then you're ready to set the condenser. My advice is get the one on the passenger side in first. Lift the whole condenser up, lift the driver's side up a little bit higher, push back on the passenger side, get it in the ear and drop it in. Then you can just drop the driver's side right into place. So now we got to put the uh, put the bolts in to hold the AC condenser in. Alright, well, 
I ended up having to fabricate a little deal to put my transmission oil cooler back in and I not that it's my preferred method of doing it, but I ended up using zip ties to just hold it in to the brackets that hold the AC condenser. So I may have to come back later and redo that, but it's good and secure. Wasn't my preference to put it in that way, but I didn't have too much of a choice. Uh, my advice would be, you gotta do this job, check to make sure if your original radiator has an oil cooler built into it, transmission oil cooler built into it or not. If it does not, then I would not pick one up that does have one because apparently the brackets are different um, whether you have one or not. So if you have an external transmission oil cooler, that's great for your transmission. Make sure your radiator is uh, doesn't have the transmission oil cooler built into the tank. That's those two red caps I showed you earlier. If those two lines are going into your transmission, clearly you want to make sure that your new, uh, are going into your radiator, clearly you want to make sure your new radiator has them. But I wouldn't have thought that the, the bolt pattern was uh, different on the little brackets, but obviously it is. So Now we got to hook up the hoses. Up radiator hose slipped on there as I was putting the radiator in. Put the lower radiator hose back on the neck. Take your channel locks and what you want to do is you want your hose clamps to end up about a quarter of an inch from the end of the hose. That'll make sure that they're clearly on the neck or firmly on the neck but not too close to the end of the hose so that it doesn't clamp. There's a, a uh, lip around the end of that neck. You want to make sure that all of the hose clamp is beyond that lip. That way you know you got a good seal. Just kind of walk it up on there. Get it where it belongs. Let it loose and then you should be good to go. <clears throat> Don't forget your overflow tube. Uh, a lot of times when you're doing a job like this, you may as well go ahead and replace the hoses. I checked them before I did anything. The hoses on this one are fine, so I didn't want to replace them. That's an easy enough job if you have to do it later. But you know, you want to check your hoses when you're doing this. Make sure there's no splitting in the ends. Make sure they're not dry rotted anywhere, um, anything like that. As long as they're good and flexible and there's no splits on them, they're fine. But if you see any cracks or dry rotting, go ahead and replace the hoses while you're doing this. Now is the easiest time to do it because you can get to everything. All right, now we'll put the fan back in. Now remember you got a couple of little ears down here at the bottom of the fan that set into the brackets uh, clips near the bottom of the radiator. And then there's two bolts that go on up to the top. So you want to make sure those bottom ears get inside the brackets. Once, you, once you've got them in there, make sure you're clear all the way around and everything else looks good. And then you can just press them down into those brackets and then your bolt holes should line up just fine. And remember there's one underneath this upper radiator hose. And then there's one right over here that you can get to and see real easily. And again, those are screwing into the nuts that we put in there earlier when we were prepping the, the new uh, radiator by putting the nuts in it and those uh, rubber isolation mounts. So now we're tightening these up. And you don't want to really torque down on them too much because you don't want to crack the plastic on the fan shroud but you do want to get them snug. It's one of the reasons I like to use a little stubby ratchet because you can't get too much torque on it. Get your, uh, don't forget your wiring harness. You snap that connector in just like so and make sure you push that red clip all the way in so that it's seated. Don't stab your finger. 
there. It should snap all the way in pretty easy if if it doesn't seek that connector again and then press it in and it'll that should take care of itself. All right. So now again being careful with your paint. You slip this down inside behind this plastic header or grill backer rather. Um, feed the cable between the AC condenser and this plastic grill backer. And uh, you got to kind of work this in. Again, being careful with the paint. I'm going to scratch everything up. This ear goes underneath the plastic grill backer because that clip goes on there that we took off earlier. You should be able to line these two holes up here in the bottom and then line all of these holes up. The headlight, the bracket that's attached to the headlight goes under this metal header. And all the bolt holes should line up just fine. Okay, like I said, remember this one has that that clip on it and the the ear on the metal header part goes underneath and that's what gets the clip put on it. it just slips on there from the side with the threaded part to the bottom and uh, all of these are those pointed yeah, those pointed fine threads I'm going to take an extension with my socket on it To start these, just finger start them. To get everything, get all the bolts started first, pretty much in the reverse order that we took them out. Just get them started. Remember the uh, the washer bottle neck ring. It's got a snap on. I'll hold that header panel up just a little bit so once it's on there that's all good. Get them started a couple of turns, make sure they're gonna line up. Alright, so everything's in there. Everything's started, nothing's bound up. I don't know if it matters, but I'm thinking I want these three bolts right here kind of lined up and snugged up first to make sure that hood latch lines up all right. All right. Now we got to do is put uh, put coolant in it. Um, fill it up up here. I've got a pressure relief cap on here. A lot of them don't have that. You just push down on the cap, turn it, comes right off. You need a funnel and you need antifreeze. If you can pour it without a funnel, good for you. <laughs> I can't. I make a mess. As far as antifreeze goes with a Jeep or Chrysler product, the original antifreeze is what they call an HOAT type coolant. That's different than your regular green antifreeze. Uh, it's also different than the orange antifreeze that General Motors uses. At least original equipment. This is an 04. Now, I don't know about what General Motors uses today or what, everybody, or what Chrysler's using today, but I know in 04 there was a difference between those antifreezes. Now, if you're in doubt, always follow your owner's manual. Go to the Chrysler dealership, get Mopar HOAT antifreeze, and you don't have to worry about it. If you don't want to do that, um, or you're like me, I, I bought Peak um, High Mileage Antifreeze, which is uh, it's a yellow orange type antifreeze. It's compatible with anything and everything. If you don't like that or you don't think I should be using that, I don't want to hear about it because that's just my choice. If you prefer to use just Mopar only, that's fine. That's your business. I have no problem with that and that's probably the safest thing to do. Uh, but don't blast me in the comments about using Peak because 
That's just what I use. But anyway, whatever type you use, make sure that you understand that the original antifreeze in this vehicle is Chrysler Mopar HOAT antifreeze. The problem with mixing different types of antifreeze is sometimes it'll give you problems with seals and some internal seals and sometimes it'll create a gel which obviously is not good because it clogs the system up and uh, prevents it from cooling. So you definitely don't want to use uh, like the green type antifreezes. Um, I'm not an antifreeze expert so uh, some of the other types that are out there may be perfectly compatible today. Again, if all else fails, follow the manual, go get Mopar HOAT antifreeze and you don't have to worry about it. This system takes 14 quarts empty. I didn't measure how much I drained, so I don't think I'm going to take a full 14 quarts because I didn't, I don't, I'm pretty sure I didn't pour that much out. But the best thing you can do is you just uh, you fill it up or, or you, you put uh, antifreeze in your system watching the bottle. It's got a mark right down here called cold fill. That's where you want your antifreeze level to be when the engine's cold. So I know I'm going to take at least a gallon, so I'm going to pour that much in. You'll hear it draining down into the cooling system. Also be aware when you buy antifreeze that it now comes in diluted and non-diluted. If you buy diluted, it'll say, it'll tell you on the front of the bottle that it's a 50-50 mixture. That means it's 50% coolant and 50% distilled water, um, which is what you want your concentration of antifreeze to be when you're done anyway. If you buy the non-diluted, take a good estimate of how much coolant you drained out of your system and put half that much in there with non-diluted antifreeze and then the other half of distilled water. Only use distilled water. Don't use tap water because there's minerals in there that will react with the aluminum in your system and clog the system up eventually. So you only want to use distilled water in your cooling system. If you buy the 50-50 that's already mixed, you don't have to worry about it because they've already used distilled water in it. And what I'm doing is I'm watching the side of my my overflow bottle, when the level in it begins to come up, then I'm going to go ahead and stop filling it and I'll run the engine until it gets warm. You can tell if the thermostat's open by touching the top radiator hose and making sure it's warm to the touch. If it is, that means your water's flowing and that level will go down. And then you can uh, burp the system, uh, let the air out, fill it back up, do that a couple of times and then you'll know you're topped off. system is uh, accepting a lot of the coolant right now. I hear it, you know, chugging out some air. So while it's doing that, I'm going to do the last step of the reassembly and put the grill on. That'll give it time to accept some more of the coolant. I changed my gloves. I'm always careful. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've always heard that antifreeze can destroy your paint. So I don't want to get antifreeze on the end of painted surfaces. You take these ears on the bottom of the grill and insert them into these holes and kind of roll it in just like the, just the opposite of how we took it off. And it'll slip in behind the fender. This one's got a little bit of damage right here so you got to push it back there but then it lines right up. Start your little torque screws by hand just like we did the header panel. Now I'm ready to, uh, to crank it up, put the uh, radiator cap back on and crank it up, let it get warm. And then once it does, once this upper radiator hose is hot, that tells me the water's, the coolant's flowing through the block. I'll see that level go down. Then I can uh, stop, let the pressure off of that cap. It's one of the reasons I like those lever caps. I can let the pressure off of it, then open it up, put some more in, if the coolant system's full. The other thing I'm going to do while it's running is I'm going to check the system for leaks. I'm going to look at the upper and lower radiator hose, the overflow hose, 
check the new radiator, make sure it's not leaking anywhere, that kind of thing. With the uh, with my radiator cap, like I said, that's one of the reasons I use those lever type because I can let release some pressure off of it. It looks like it took another maybe a cork. Put the cap back on it, and then I'm going to do it again. Last but not least, we have to burp the system. We have to get the air out of the system. Otherwise, you're going to hear it gurgling on the inside in your uh, heater core all the time. Every time you give it a little bit of gas, you're going to hear it gurgle. So right here on top of this, where the upper radiator hose is, this neck right here, there's an 8 millimeter cap head screw. You need an 8 millimeter Allen wrench. And what you do is you let it run, you get, let it get good and warm. That upper radiator hose is hot. And we're going to crack that open just a little bit and let, that, let it bubble out air. When the air stops bubbling out, you, uh, you know that you've got it burped. All right, so hopefully you'll be able to see it bubbling. It'll take two or three turns. Just real slowly open it up. it up too much because then it'll just overflow your, your coolant. You'll see it bubbling. But once it once it's just running coolant out and you're getting no more air, you can check it by hitting the throttle a little bit. You just get cool. And then you can tighten it back down. And if you, uh, if you get in the car and you run it and you hear it gurgling in the uh, heater core up underneath the dash, you know you still have air in there. You need to burp it again. Well, okay, folks, so now the system's all full. It's the coolant level is showing full when the engine's hot. I'll check it again after it cools back off to make sure that it's reading uh, full at the cold fill line. I've checked the system for leaks. I've got no leaks around any of the hoses or anything like that. Um, everything is, uh, the fan's running. I made sure it was running. So everything's checking out okay. So looks like we're finished. So thanks for watching my video. I appreciate it. Uh, subscribe to my channel if you would. And I uh, hope to see you back soon. Uh, thanks a lot.